Hello friends and welcome to Kerala PSC Assistant Professor in English. Let's learn together marathon. We are starting our marathon with Batter My Heart written by John Dunn. Okay, this is the sonnet 14. Okay, sonnet 14 from Songs and Sonnets. Holy Sonnets 14, Divine Meditations, Divine Sonnets. We can name it in these titles okay so the first opening line is batter my heart three person god for you so it is written in petrarchan style consists of two quatrains and a sestect so uh, i'm just going through the main points and keywords um, of all the subjects uh, i want to go through in this marathon so the summary and the detailed analysis you can you know uh, take a look on many famous websites like you know wikipedia or udemy courses there are many online courses available related to literature so i just want to go through the main keywords and aspects of all subjects so first starting with batter my heart it was published in 1633 it's a sonnet okay so the theme of the poem is a paradox of death and rebirth so the poet develops two metaphors it is very important you know first is that of a besieged town and second that of a marriage okay so all this you will analyze when you go through the poem so it's uh, the poem is in the form of a prayer to god you know to to break and reshape <clears throat> the poet so it's like a desperate and violent plea to god The poet requests God to abandon his mild ways and adopt a stern measures to reclaim him from devil's clutches. You know, the, the comparison of himself with a woman betrothed to God's enemy Satan is, is very excellent. That's one of the two metaphors. And um, so the poet prays to God to use force and break the unholiness between the devil and himself. So that is all about batter my heart. So the questions that can be expected from this poem is the, you know, the spirituality in this poem. Um, how the poet wants help from God uh, to escape from Satan. The next poem by John Dunn is a canonization. So it's a five stanza of nine lines. And each stanza ends with the word love. That's something peculiar. So uh, love itself is the central experience of the poem. So canonization, we all know that it refers to the process by which people are inducted to the canon of saints. But here we can see that the poet, the poet and the lover they are canonized because of love so the lover pleads to left alone with his love while the outsider who objects to his love can do whatever he wants the comparisons you know the, the lovers are compared to tapers and the phoenix eagle dove so that kind of comparison should be pointed out and also the everyday things which are not affected because of the love of the poet and the lover. The examples, they are examples of hyperboles. So the canonization is not that of a pair of saints who denounced the fleshly world, but lovers who have found their hermitage in one another's body so here indirectly done questions the criteria for saintliness so in canonization we can expect questions uh, like um, 
the metaphysical conceits and devices used by Dunn, which is extraordinary and which is different from ordinary, you know, uh, he is just like mocking the Petrarchan sonnets. So how it is different from an ordinary poem? So that kind of uh, questions can be asked for canonization. We are moving on to the next author that is John Milton. So John Milton's first poem that we have in our syllabus is Lycidas on his monody which was published on 1637. So it's a pastoral elegy for Edward King, Milton's friend at Cambridge. So here we can see the traditional conventions of pastoral elegiac style. The invocations of the laurels and muses, the procession of mourners, complaints to the muses and then the inevitability of you know death or the helplessness before the fate and at the end we can see a hope there that Edward King is in heaven with angels so that note of grief or loss gives way to a note of reconciliation, resignation. And he claims that Lycidas is not dead, he is in heaven. So there is a famous digression in Lycidas that it just deviates from the topic and just discusses about the fame and the corrupt clergy, which is aligned with the pastoral tradition. And it also uh, depicts nature, nature also grieving on the death of Edward King. Nature becomes a part of the, you know, the human world. So uh, Lycidas should have a detailed analysis on the conventions of pastoral elegiac style the questions can be like this uh, you know Lycidas as a pastoral elegy what are the features that you can analyze in Lycidas which makes it a pastoral elegy next is paradise lost book 9 so why book 9 is important because it is a key book of the poem the main action of the disobedience, the fall of man happens in book 9. That's how it becomes a key book. So, um, what happens is that Satan gets into a sleeping serpent and tempts Eve to eat the fruit from the forbidden tree. And she eats it. And also makes Adam to eat it. And there they losses their paradise. Their eye opens. They had committed sin. And they realized about their body. They realized the shame. And at the end we can see that they quarrel each other. So, book 9 is in such a way it is important among the 12 books of Paradise Lost. So, from this um, we can expect questions like the epic similes used in the poem. So, it's an epic like work so we can expect epic like questions also next is john dryden's mac fleck no so the subtitle is 
a satire upon the true blue protestant poet T.S. Thomas Shadwell. So in this poem we have to give importance to the Shadwell's coronation scene, then Flecknoe's speech and also the conclusion. These three parts are very important. So here we can see Dryden representing Shadwell as having inherited the stupidity of an Irish priest named you know, Richard Flecknoe who thought himself as a poet and who had recently died. So um, theme is the choice of Shadwell by Flecknoe as his heir to the kingdom of nonsense and dullness. So the coronation scene, it happens in an ancient watchtower barbican in augusta it's it was a site for brothels and inferior entertainment and shadwell holds a mug of ale in his left hand and the copy of flecknoe's play love's kingdom in the right hand these things should be noted and a stock of dull books were spread over the way and Flecknoe's speech is the next important thing that, uh, you know, he urges Shadwell to trust his own gifts, not to labor too much. And um, instead of imitating great playwrights like Johnson or successful ones like Edridge, he should make uh, poetasters his models. And the conclusion is that you know, when Flecknoe's speech is over, a trap door opens and beneath him and he sinks down. So it's like the prophet Elijah's mantle descending upon Elijah. Fleck Flecknoe's mantle rises upward and then lands upon Shadwell. So from this poem, we can uh, expect that, you know, that satire or the lampoon used by John Dryden on Thomas Shadwell.